This paper was presented at the International Bridge Conference in Pittsburgh in June 2013. It concerns buckling and the use of finite element analysis in the design of steel bridges. Buckling. It happens. You may recognize this picture, the Marcy Bridge in New York State which collapsed during construction back in 2002. The way in which it collapsed, a global buckling mode, was not covered by specifications of the time. That mode could have been predicted by finite element analysis and that has been the subject of several excellent papers by others in the past. But so often, at the first mention of finite elements, a whole bunch of engineers think, this is not for me. It's like there are two planets. One is the world of the code of practice and the other is the world of finite elements. Separate planets and you would need special training to travel from one to the other. And when you got there you wouldn't understand a word they were saying. I'm hoping that this presentation will help us see that this isn't true at all. Instead these two spheres are complementary. We sometimes need both to knock down the pins. And so what I want to show here is how finite element buckling analysis complements codes of practice rules. The key considerations in performing such analyses and the methods available for identifying those global buckling modes like the one which caused the Marcy collapse. Most of all, whether you're a client, a manager, or an alien from one of those two planets, I hope this presentation will help you approach buckling problems with more confidence. First, some basics. Central to most engineers' understanding of buckling is the Euler buckling load. Most familiar of all is the critical elastic buckling load in a pin-ended strut. Euler derived this formula from a differential equation describing the lateral deflection of the column. But there's actually an infinite number of solutions to that differential equation reflecting the fact that the column can buckle in many modes. What we're familiar with is just the first solution because typically it's the lowest mode which is of interest, the lowest elastic buckling load. Now, if Euler had been into matrices, he might have solved the problem differently, numerically. He would have told us that the eigenvalue of the stress-stiffness matrix gives us the elastic buckling load. The elastic buckling load obtained by Euler's formulae or by other numerical means such as using a finite element model and asking for an eigenvalue buckling solution, they're the same thing. They can be used interchangeably. It's important for engineers to have confidence in the solution by doing a very simple example and we can learn some things from that example. This is a pin-ended strut. It can't get much simpler than that. If we compare the Euler calculation with a result from a finite element model, eigenvalue buckling analysis, we get the same answer. You'd expect that. And just as in Euler's solution, there are an infinite number of buckling modes. The same is true of our eigenvalue solutions, but the one with the lowest elastic buckling load is generally the one of interest. Now the elastic buckling load is not the real failure load, and this is because Euler considered a perfect strut with no residual stresses from its fabrication, made of elastic material, perfectly straight and with no consideration of any early deformations which might bring in some eccentricity to the loading condition. Perfection like that doesn't ex even exist in Switzerland where Euler was from and so the real failure load is lower than the elastic buckling load. 
Traditionally, we visualize this for struts of different slenderness using buckling curves like this one. The horizontal axis is slenderness and the vertical axis is buckling load. Slenderness is defined by the ratio yield stress over elastic buckling stress. For struts this can be reduced to effective length over radius of gyration. But at heart the definition of slenderness is the same. Yield over elastic buckling stress. If we know the slenderness value for a member, which is based on the elastic buckling load, we can read the failure load from this empirically derived curve. The elastic buckling load might be found using one of the many formula given in section 6.9.4.1. Or it may be found from an eigenvalue buckling analysis. It's essentially the same either way. From that point, once you have the elastic buckling load, you can use the codified formula to find the failure load. In the Euro code, they don't give you any formula for elastic buckling loads at all. They figure that the engineer can either find them in a textbook or use an eigenvalue buckling analysis. The principle is the same for long plates in compression. The slenderness is again derived or defined as in terms of the elastic buckling stress. Ashto gives us a general expression for elastic buckling stress of a plate where k is a coefficient which is a function of load and support conditions. Values of k may be obtained from textbooks for a limited number of conditions or alternatively the elastic buckling stress may be obtained using an eigenvalue buckling analysis. So we can see that the elastic buckling load or stress plugs into the code formula for member resistance and we can get that elastic buckling load from an FE analysis instead of a textbook formula. It needs to be with care but it will work. The important thing here is that means we can consider any cross section and structural layout, any loading conditions any support conditions, we can consider the member in the context of the whole structure. We can't get that kind of flexibility from textbook formulae. But we do need some knowledge in order to get that elastic buckling load from our FE software. Without giving a whole course in finite elements, I can only outline the key considerations here but they are worth thinking about. First, if you have a working linear elastic model, you have all the data required for the software to give you the eigenvalue buckling modes and elastic critical loads. So the first step is to construct a working linear static model. But we need to keep the end aim in sight. So we need, first of all, the right finite element type. Where a structural member has a plan area which is large by comparison to its thickness, it can typically be represented using shell elements. So our plating compression can be represented with shell elements. Where a structural member is long by comparison to its cross-section dimensions, that member can typically be represented using beam elements so our strut can be represented with beam elements. We'd use 3D elements of course since buckling can happen in any direction and might involve torsion or twisting. The only confusion here is our H section is made up of flanges and a web 
and those components could each be represented using shell elements. But that's okay. If we represent the same strut with shell elements, we can get the same answer. But in our infinite number of buckling modes, we will also find local or plate buckling modes. If the H section is a rolled section, the plates are typically sized so that the lowest buckling mode, the one with the lowest elastic buckling load, doesn't involve buckling of the plates. That being the case, a beam element model is fine and will use less CPU time. There are other element types we might use, such as continuum elements, but typically for steel structures, beam and shell elements will do the job. Second, we need enough elements. Each beam element, or each shell element, has an underlying mathematical formulation, and that defines how well it replicates certain effects. For instance, we could ask, how well does an element replicate bending moments in a normal linear static analysis? For a very simple example, this is a fixed ended beam under a uniformly distributed load. If we have beam elements which support a quadratic change of bending moment across each element, the results are found very accurately with only five elements or fewer. In fact, one element would be sufficient since the bending moment curve is quadratic. If we had beam elements that supported a linear change of bending moment, we can see that the curve can't be replicated exactly. We get this faceted bending moment diagram, and the peak results have some error, relatively small. If, on the other hand, we use beam elements that support only a constant bending moment, then we get this stepped diagram. And the problem here is that numbers we're getting are now significantly adrift from the true values. In fact, for this example, the moments at the fixed ends are only half the answer we're expecting. If we double the number of elements, well, we get an improvement, but we're still quite significantly drift. If we double the number of elements again and again we see how the bending moment results are getting nearer and nearer the expected answer. The point here is that using a small number of elements can be unconservative but as we increase the number of elements we see convergence towards the right answer. Now in this case we knew the right answer so we can say when the results are good enough. But typically, of course, we're using finite element analysis because we don't know the answer. That's the whole point. What's needed, unless we have a lot of experience with the software and the type of structure, is for us to test the model using increasing number of elements until we see convergence for our key results. In our eigenvalue buckling analysis, we will rerun the analysis to see if the elastic critical buckling mode shape or load is changed by using more elements. Like any analysis, if we put rubbish in, we get rubbish out. So we need to check our material parameters, cross sections, loads and so on. But the critical issue here is this. We can look at the deformed shape and ask ourselves, does it look right? If the structure hasn't, for example, buckled in the way you expected, say it buckles about the major axis, not the minor axis, or it buckles in an unexpected torsional mode, or well, sometimes that's due to bad assumption or bad data in the model, most commonly wrong support conditions. But sometimes it's because our understanding of the structural behavior was incomplete we forgot about torsion for example. When we see it we realize that the computer has identified some behavior as being important which we had disregarded. We must always check computer models but they can also challenge us and that's a good thing.
If we use a textbook formula to obtain our elastic buckling load, we are relying on selecting the right formula. We use our understanding of the behavior of the structure at that stage, then we proceed blind, unable to challenge or confirm that understanding. We might imagine that proceeding blind is fine for simple structures, but the Marcy Bridge was a single span bridge with no skew, no curve. Maybe the formula said it was alright. It wasn't. And as papers have shown, a finite element analysis could have shown us what was going to happen. And what happened at Marcy, that global system buckling is not limited to tub girders. It's equally applicable to pairs of eye girders or other systems. Currently, Ashto rules are intended to deal with flange buckling and web buckling. This kind of failure. And lateral torsional buckling, of course and we can see in this finite element model how the buckling is occurring between bracing locations. That's our assumption effectively when we use Ashto and we treat each girder individually. There are formula for elastic critical stress in Ashto and once again we could use eigenvalue analysis instead or as a check so we're not calculating blind. But moreover, in some cases, there may be lower buckling modes in which a pair of girders, or perhaps three or four girders, depending on the arrangement, buckle, not between bracing points, but over the length of the span, taking the bracing with them. That global buckling of the girder system has traditionally been ignored because the system seems to be loaded so as to bend about its minor axis. The assumption is that it will not buckle sideways because that is about the major axis of the entire system. There are no formula in Ashto and that assumption has been traced back in literature over a hundred years but it still turns out to be a bad assumption as the Marcy collapse demonstrates. The NCHRP produced an excellent report at the end of last year, 2012, Report 725, which gives guidance on a whole range of issues relating to steel girder bridges, including this one. The report gives a simplified expression for the critical elastic buckling moment of the girder system. In essence, this formula is quite similar to the Ashto lateral torsional buckling formula. Both are based on the theoretical solution for doubly symmetric eye sections under constant moment. And so includes CB which is a moment gradient modifier. This formula also assumes all the girders to be identical to one another. Prismatic straight and of course it takes no account of skew. Report 725 says that the engineer may need to exercise judgment in applying the formula. But what we want is a critical elastic buckling moment. So just like the Euler strut, the plate or any other elastic buckling problem, we can find the buckling modes and the elastic buckling load using an eigenvalue buckling analysis. Using finite elements we can obtain the elastic buckling load without all those assumptions. We can then consider non-symmetrical, non-prismatic girders with curves and skews. However you calculate it, this elastic buckling load is not the real failure load. It's still based on Euler's perfect world. But just like the Euler strut, it is useful, and Report 725 says that we can use this to calculate an amplification factor.
In this formula, M max G is the maximum global moment applied, for example, during the pouring of the deck slab. And MCRG is the critical elastic buckling moment from the simple formula or from an eigenvalue buckling analysis. If the amplification factor AFG is less than 1.1, then the guidance in the report is that second order effects can be neglected. An identical threshold is used in the Euro codes, although it is expressed slightly differently. If the amplification factor is greater than 1.25, the report recommends using a second order or geometric nonlinear 3D finite element analysis. If we consider the Marcy Bridge, for example, an eigenvalue Buckley analysis will lead us to an amplification factor of about 10. We probably don't need guidance to know that 10 is likely to be a problem. But in other cases, the Gerda system is more stable. In this case, the eigenvalue buckling factor is about 16, and this leads to an amplification factor of less than 1.1. So the guidance in report 725 is that second order effects may be neglected. In this example though, the amplification factor from an eigenvalue analysis under self-weight is greater than 1.25 and this indicates that significant second order effects are expected. <coughs> but with a 20 degree skew, the amplification factor is somewhat lower. This is because of opposing twists which the NCHRP simple formula cannot take into account. A moderate plan curvature in this case didn't affect the amplification factor as much as we may have expected. However the bracing members had to be increased in size as they buckled elastically at a lower load than the girders. This change in behaviour from the straight bridge goes to show the importance of 3D analysis for curved structures. We've seen now how eigenvalue Buckley analysis can give us values which can be plugged into codified rules or used to calculate amplification factors, and how we can visualise the structural behaviour and challenge our engineering understanding. But we can take the FE analysis further. We can use a nonlinear analysis to determine the exact failure load. To return to our simple pin ended strut, we can carry out an analysis and compare the predictive failure loads with the member resistance from Ashto. An analysis like this needs to incorporate geometric nonlinearity that is large displacement theory and material nonlinearity that is yielding and hardening but perhaps the important point that's easy to miss for an analysis like this is the imperfection the column strength curves I showed earlier and the Ashto rules for column columns assume an ideal initial out of straightness of length over 1500 and in this example if we use length over 1500 in our nonlinear analysis we agree the maximum load to within less than 1% but if a larger initial out of straightness is assumed we get a lower and lower maximum load so it's important when considering a structure to use the appropriate initial imperfection. For bridge girders where lateral torsional buckling is a consideration, span over 300 would probably be a good starting point with reference to AISC 303-10, the Euro codes and the old British standards. This can lead to a large percentage reduction in capacity, in this case leading to over 20% reduction. And existing structures may not be fabricated 
or constructed to modern tolerances. So using Ashto rules for such structures could be unsafe. Let's just summarize a good approach. Start with a linear elastic analysis. Use the right element type, check your mesh refinement, check your data and the behavior of the model. Carry out an eigenvalue buckling analysis. Look at the buckled shape. If it doesn't look right, that might indicate some problem with the model or some structural behavior we'd mentally disregarded. But assuming everything checks out, the elastic buckling load we find could be used in conjunction with codified rules for a member resistance calculation. Or it could be used to calculate an amplification factor. Finally, you can move on to nonlinear analysis if outside the limits of the codes. Include an initial imperfection or out of straightness. Test the model using geometric nonlinearity or large displacement theory and bring in material nonlinearity yielding at with hardening. You might also need to think about liftoff supports. In conclusion, elastic critical buckling loads can be obtained from formula or from eigenvalue buckling analysis. The eigenvalue analysis approach is more flexible for variable cross-section types, curves, skews, support conditions and so on. Wherever they come from, they can be plugged in to member resistance rules. They can be used to help predict global buckling stability as in the NCHRP report 725 amplification factor. Nonlinear analysis can provide an alternative to member resistance rules, particularly where the magnitude of imperfections is important. Material and geometric nonlinearity must be combined. Good agreement with codes of practice can be demonstrates, demonstrated. As the demands on the industry for smarter solutions are always growing, our hope is that by bringing together the, those two spheres, codes of practice and finite elements, we can deliver more. This is an example of a full nonlinear analysis with the stars showing the material yielding and the stress being shed onto an other parts of the model. We are also ramping up the load to failure with heavily exaggerated deformations and you can even see the plastic hinges forming through the girders. Thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to receive any questions or comments and you can email me at terry.cakebread at lucas.com. <laughs>